I appreciate you doing this. Like I said, I I think we're in the in the same company because you know Jennifer Bridges, and yes. we had Jennifer on our podcast. And I think there was a flyer. She showed a flyer or something, and um, I saw you on it. Listen to your podcast, and I thought it was very unique and very good. And I was like, wow, this this girl has a lot of balls because she's white, right? <laughs> female and then Very. She, and then she's talking about like radical feminism like racism and stuff like that so i was like we got to talk to her and yeah you live in i Texas, mean so truth has no skin color and it's like it's so easy to point out the hypocrisy and legitimate blatant racism of the left um how they don't care about black babies they don't care about black people they just want to use them for votes for numbers even with this um you know the border crisis that's happening right now they don't look at these people as people they look at them as potential potential voters for their platform because they know that they're getting so unpopular. So I appreciate uh, I appreciate the compliment. But yeah, Jennifer Bridges, she is a warrior. She's amazing. And the event that we did, um, I was the MC for it. So it was, it was a fun time. It was a really good event. That's great. So how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, you're good. I just turned 20 like a month ago or two months ago. Wow. That's you're so young and you're like in it. You're in the the, the deeps of it. So how did you, <laughs> you mentioned you're a YouTuber and I, I caught some background in your podcast that that's how you got into media and things like that. But where did it all start and um, how'd you get here? Yeah. So I started, as I said, doing like YouTube lifestyle, fashion, like very like, um, lifestyle blogger style content on YouTube. Very wholesome, very unproblematic. I spent a lot of time in LA, got connected with some pretty you know, important people there. Um, and I actually, it's so pivotal to my story. And I think it's so funny. I had a fake relationship with like this one other influencer guy. And I actually, after a year of that, I actually fell in love with my neighbor back at home here in Texas. And I basically like broke it off with the fake relationship. And I was like, cause he fell in love with me. I didn't fall in love with him. And I was kind of like, Hey, like, this isn't going to work out. Um, and that basically that fake relationship was kind of my quote unquote ticket it to everything that I'd ever wanted. Right. We'd been interviewed for reality TV shows. His sister would do like concerts. Like she's a really famous influencer um, who has now come out as a lesbian. And so oh, wow. the Lord definitely pulled me away from that. Um, and basically, yeah. And then, so I fell in love with my neighbor at the beginning of 2020, a month and a half later, COVID happens and I would never be able to go to LA at all. And so through that year, I kind of just, I lost my passion for doing YouTube. I was like, I feel like there's no direction, no purpose. Um, I had finished a series that I was doing and I was basically like, I don't have any other ideas for a series that I could do. So um, I'll just take a break. So I took a break and I started a political podcast. I opened a ministry. And ever since then, as I said, I've gotten involved with Turning Point, Prager U, because I've always been a Christian conservative. Um, in fact, I was actually, I was brought up as a homeschooler and people are always like, wow, you're so well socialized for a homeschooler. And I'm like, it's so offensive, but I appreciate <laughs> it nonetheless. Um, and so I've just kind of been throughout my whole life, paving my own way, kind of making my own path. And now, as you see here, I have my podcast studio. I do political stuff, uh, as I said, a public speaker and um, didn't go to college. That's also a big point on why I can like actually pursue this full time. I own a social media management company um, as of December 2021, and we are growing. We have more clients than we know what to do with. So it's it's been really cool. And the Lord has just heaped blessing upon me. And as I said, I just I would love to get a show, a turning point prayer um blaze ideally daily wire in the end but i do have a new show called sanity check where i go to college campuses and i literally go and test their sanity and that's been a really fun development <laughs> yeah, in my talk, career yeah talk about that real quick so what do you like what kind of questions are you asking and what kind of feedback do you get Oh, it's super fun. So sanity check, as I said, we go to college campuses and we have a few different metrics where we test people's sanity or the campus's sanity generally. And we start with it's not just man on the street style because everyone can go up to someone and ask them questions. I wanted to do a little bit more. And with that, um, we go to their college campuses. We go to the most you know, populated part of school where lots of foot traffic is happening. We set up a tabling event and then we we have a petition. And so this petition, um, let's say, for example, I went to UC Santa Barbara and we said our petition was the college board should add a black history section to the SAT sign here. If you agree, we also have another one that's sign here. If you don't agree and you think the SAT is perfectly fine as it is. And so basically we kind of gauge the campus, um, their insanity based off of those petitions. And then after, if the student gives us their name and email on our petition, 
we're like, hey, as our gift to you, we'd love to give you a flag. And we give them the choice between a handheld American flag or a handheld LGBTQ flag. And um, at the end of the episode, we count up how many flags are left of each group. And spoiler alert, California and all of the Texas schools, except one school, uh, UT Arlington had all the LGBTQ flags gone in like an hour and a half. So wow. It's pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty sad. But then after that, we asked the students some questions and the questions we asked them are specifically formulated to reveal the amount of political indoctrination that student has been steeped in. So we asked them, you know, do you think women are even real or um, is abortion mean or should more white or black people own land? Just like very odd and outrageous questions. My personal favorite was we asked students at UC Santa Barbara, do you think that, that the, um, Pride movement should be more inclusive of people who want to date their siblings. So that was <laughs> what, what, four out of the 10 answers were like, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Shit. And then after that, our fourth metric is we talked to the student chapter, the college chapter who brought us and hosted us. Yeah. Yeah. Turning point, whoever it is about the persecution they've been through, how the faculty and administration are and things like that. After that, we kind of accumulate all that into a five minute episode, give the school a score. And I'm really hoping that this could be, you know, exposing for First of all, the radical leftism on college campuses, but also a really good and valuable resource for parents and students to look at, get a snapshot of the culture of a school before they spend a thousand dollars on a plane ticket, hotel, go and tour the school and figure out they don't like the school at all. So, mm. yeah, Lee, you're in it. Yeah. Is, how serious do you think the students are taking the surveying, though? Do you think they're, you know, playing around? I mean, it's it's in their nature and they're of the age to just goof around all the time, right? Do you yeah. think they took it serious? So <laughs> I, per if I was a student, I would be like, you clearly made this petition on Google Docs. This is totally like not legit. But most students, as soon as they hear the buzzwords, they go, oh, let me sign. You know, if we say diversity on campus, if we say, you know, people of color, if we say, um, you know, believe all women, things like that, mm -hmm. immediately half of them are like, yes. A lot of times, though, you can tell um, by just reading the person, which one they, you know, which one they would sign, but also like a lot of students are hesitant to sign because they're like, I don't want to put my name or email on anything. So we're interacting with probably a hundred students at every college campus. And I'd say about 70% of them do sign the 30% are like, eh, I don't, I don't feel good about doing this. I don't know if my opinions about that, which is, you know, perfectly respectable. We just let them go about their day. So, a lot of them take it seriously as soon as they hear the buzzword. Yeah. M Mike and I always joke about that. So we work in corporate America and there's those buzzwords. There's, um, you know, diversity, like you said, inclusiveness. Oh like, yeah. Equity. Can, yeah. You can get into a meeting and just say these things and people think that you're smarter, think that you're serious. And you know, like, it's, it's funny how it applies in everyday life. I'm curious though. Do you think that these kids that are coming out of college, it's cool to be, woke right when you're young and all that good stuff do you think they transition into more of a moderate conservative as they get older maybe as they start having families um or starting to pay bills or things like that do you think they get away from the so far left and get more centered well i'd sure hope so that's my first initial reaction my um experience very limited in corporate america you know because i am a media person right I would say most people stick with the values and they don't actually get more conservative, uh, specifically people my age, like Gen Z, early millennials or late millennials that is going into the workforce. We've seen the workforce get softer. We've seen it get more woke. We've seen the demand for every single company to make a political statement about every single issue really start to heighten. And so I would say, yeah, I hope that they as soon as they have to start paying taxes, they're like, oh, wait, I'd much rather keep my money or I'd much rather my children not be like abused and sexually indoctrinated by their teachers when they go to school. Again, though, as we're seeing with social media and the corporate world climate that we have now, um, I don't know if that's necessarily happening. I just know that people are getting a lot more set in their ways and the polarization is definitely growing. Big, big, big question here. Where, where do you think it's all coming from? Who's who's driving these campaigns and how do we all how is it penetrating everything as far as like corporate America, social media, um, just how do we all know it without even knowing we've been taught? You know what I mean? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it actually started happening like kind of in the 1920s. So, um, oh crap, what's his name? I'm like forgetting the name of the president who was there. Um, yeah. Anyway, he passed the Women's Rights Act. Woodrow Wilson. Why did I forget that? He basically had this agenda where he was like, the point of education is to make a son as different from his father as he can be. So really, we started seeing this unfolding in this this um, working in of Marxist principles and leftism and progressivism into academia really throughout the 1920s. And it's kind of, you know, really skyrocketed since then. And this kind of feeds into a little bit to do with feminism in the last hundred years, too, because obviously we had World War One. 1920s, Great Depression, World War II. That was a time of very radical, like very, very radical change in the thinking, the philosophical and political thinking in Europe and obviously in America. And that really reshaped a lot of, you know, what our priorities are. And so with this radical second wave feminism that arose out of World War II, we get a lot of, you know, Betty Friedan's writing where she really emphasized that, oh, men and women relate to the workforce and they are fulfilled by the same exact things, which obviously is not true. We, with this sexual revolution, really, it was just like a slow progression of taking over um, all the industries that we possibly can. I mean, we have Rupert Murdoch who, um, well, he's dead now, but he, you know, built up this huge media conglomerate. He was the first one who started building media as it is today, right? Gossip and the biggest headlines and the most shocking pictures you can. It doesn't matter what you have to go do to get the story. You just have to get attention, right? And then, of course, as you said, we have the rise of social media. And so it's been a very coordinated effort to start indoctrinating and changing and controlling people really ever since Woodrow Wilson. And then it really took a really fast turn after World War II with the rise of second wave feminism and the sexual revolution. So kind of to bring all that thought together, I'm just throwing a lot of random history facts at you guys. But, um, you know, human nature never really changes. And every man or woman, women can be the worst fascists, let me tell you. Um, but every person wants control over another group of people. And that was the question that Satan asked Eve in the garden. He, she said, um, you know, you could be like gods. And did God really say that you would surely die if you ate from the tree? And so the corruption of man is always to want more, to gain more, to be like a God. And that's a temptation that we fall into. So we've just had a really, um, the conservatives, we haven't seen this happening. Now we're seeing it happen a little bit now, but it really is just coming from that root of I want power over other people. And I'm going to use every institution that I can and weaponize every institution to get to that end. So that's my um, TED talk on <laughs> <laughs> the progression of the radical left. But yeah, after the World War II, it really got bad. We, we get into this conversation a lot about, I guess, wokeness is what you can define it as. But um some of this is good though, right? I mean, some of it is, you know, women's rights and, and diversity. Some of it's good, but it's like, it's like really high on the spectrum right now. It's like overwhelming right now. Uh, mm. I assume you think some of it's good. I mean, could you decipher what's oh. good and bad in your, in your oh, mind? Oh my gosh. This is like my second favorite question ever. <laughs> my first favorite question is why, why are you a Christian? But okay. Yes. <laughs> I think that first wave feminism technically, which would have been from the 1840s to the 1920s, getting women the right to vote. That was the legal goal of um, um, first wave feminism. It wasn't called feminism back then, but that's what we type it as now. So I think that legal rights for women is amazing. I think that is something that should be protected till you know your last dying breath. Every person should have the right to function equally in a, in a society. Society in America obviously was one of the first places to ever conceive of that idea and then actually pull it off legislatively. I also think that diversity is a beautiful thing, but forced diversity is probably the worst thing ever. Hallelujah. Right? It's just like <laughs> You're forced like, femininity, <laughs> forced masculinity. You can't force someone to adhere to a cultural social value that you have. <laughs> you know what's funny too with this recent Supreme Court leak? Everybody's talking about like, oh, well, you know, conservatives are so racist and they want to just da, da, da. and I'm like, OK, well, first of all, if you want to bring like diversity into this, first of all, what about all the black babies who are dying every single year, specifically in New York City? The stats are really the most dangerous place for a black person to be is in his mother's womb Holy in New shit. York City or in New yeah. York in general. So, you know, but they're like, oh, like we want diversity. And I'm like, do you realize that the court 
the Supreme Court is the most diverse that we've ever had it. And they are fighting for life. We have a black Supreme Court justice and a woman Supreme Court justice who voted to save other black babies. And I'm like, how could you possibly say that that is racist, racist? But I would also say that, like, that is a huge win for real and true and authentic diversity. Right. I mean, the, the way that we have now, I mean, like her or not, we have a black woman as um, vice president. And hey, a lot of people say she was affirmative action to in. And I also agree with that. Um, but again, forced diversity is never something that we should pursue. Uh, forced anything really is not is not great when it comes to cultural and social values. So how do you do it then in, in a world of uh, sub corruption everywhere and uh, and in groups and like uh uh, tribalism and like we kind of group and make them, no matter what we're going to form these little groups and there's going to be corruption how, how do you do it without forcing it in your opinion that's a great question um, well first of all you get the government to stop having us fill quotas of diversity things of the like you know you stop getting corporations from having to fill diversity quotas and all that and then really you're going to hate this answer but like you have to engage in it in your own um, volition in your own communities. I mean, you have to make an effort to be like, if I'm going to prioritize legitimate and natural diversity, then I'm going to make a point to maybe, you know, speak to people that I'm not necessarily um, associated with through church school or whatever. I think that's really important to take it upon yourself to actually preach those values. But I would even go so far to say, don't let diversity be a goal of yours. Let America, let American ideas be the goal of yours, because America was built um, to include everyone. As we commonly say, we're a melting pot, right? America is literally just made up of a bunch of like European immigrants. And then, you know, uh, over time, other immigrants actually started coming here. And that's what gives us our amazing diversity. And so if you can just go back and rally around the American and fundamentally Christian ideals, then race automatically falls away. The quota of diversity falls away immediately. And so I would say, make race not matter to you. And I, it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. I'm not make race not matter to you at all, because first of all, it doesn't. Second, you should focus on bigger ideas than just skin color. So I don't know. Hopefully no. that answers your question. No, I agree. I, I get on this, this high horse, you know, I'm Hispanic and I feel like it's disingenuous when companies are, they have a quota. Every company or every corporation has a quota to meet when they're yeah. doing these hiring programs or if they're reviewing a bunch of candidates or whatever, the, the minority candidate right now is more often going to get the position just because he or she is a minority. It's yeah. even like I joke around with Mike and I said this before, it's like almost really bad right now to be white. Because you have oh, the odds. it's not almost it is. <laughs> yeah. We are the only white people specifically like of descent from the British Isles, which my genetic test, I am 150 percent from the British Isles, like Scotland, Ireland, England. That's it. Right. And it, we are the only group that you are legally now allowed to hate on and discriminate against with the odd exception of Asian people with college applications. That's sometimes a little bit gray, but literally like we are actively being disenfranchised by our own country that our Christianity, our morals, we built this country, not me, but like my ancestors and y'all's ancestors. And so, you know, the product of this and the fallout of this is actually going to be really ugly. And what I mean by that is specifically with men, you're seeing this very radical movement of people who are like, fine, if you're going to hate me because of my skin color, I'm going to embrace my skin color even more. And so all of a sudden, the whole white supremacist thing that the left has been accusing us of for the last 20 years is is almost going to become a reality. And I would say in some pockets, it has started becoming a reality, because if you're going to attack me for something that I literally can't change about myself, like, oops, sorry, then I'm going to get defensive about that. And I think it's going to have a really ugly fallout. And I would say it's a completely intentional um, twisting and manipulating of race to kind of divide the nation. But do you, it, it kind of sucks that we have to, like if we identify, if we like something that the right is doing or we like something that the, the left is doing, you almost get classified or labeled as, uh, you know, right now you get labeled as a Trumper if you support, you know, uh, closing the border or support, you know, tight border restrictions. You get, oh, well, you're a Trumper. Or if you support, um, you know, if you're if you're pro-choice over pro-life, you, you're an automatic. Like, 
where are we going to get back into where we're just we can just be and we don't have to be labeled as you know a right or a left person because i like personally i have some beliefs that are more conservative and then i also have some beliefs that are not not woke at all but you know reside right. more on the left side and i i don't feel like i have a home on either side of the party yeah that's a, that's a cool place to be honestly because you can hear both sides really easily when the rest of us get caught up in an echo chamber and I definitely, you know, I'm always trying to educate myself on what the others are saying and rubbing it up against my own moral compass and truth. Um, so how do we, what was the question again? How do we get to a place where it's not oversimplified anymore? Well, I think, I think there's a lot of people that probably reside more in the middle than on either side of the spectrum, but mm -hmm. all you hear is like the extreme sides clashing at each other. And that's where we, we really don't make any progress on anything because it's just who can scream louder, who has more money to make things happen. So I don't yeah. know. You know what I mean? You get discounted we, real quick too. I, yeah. Like you, you get dismissed. If you have one, you're like, oh, this, this is your label here. I, I dismiss you. No, nothing you say is going to uh, make any sense to me at this point. Right. Right. No. And that and that is really where we are in society. In high school, I did a speech called oversimplification of ideas and it did really well because it resonated with every person in the room. I said, just because you, you know, voted for Trump doesn't mean that you can't have any nuances in your political opinions. And so kind of my verdict on that was just be OK with varying degrees of political ideas. Just be OK with varying degrees of beliefs. Be OK with the idea that beliefs can change. And unlike gender and sex, beliefs actually are more fluid. And so that's the first action point is literally just getting to a place in society where we're OK with a little bit of complexity and not terrified of it. Um, we're, re we're very scared of extensive knowledge now, specifically with Gen Z, because our attention span is literally statistically worse than a goldfish. We have like two seconds of attention span. A goldfish has like six to eight seconds. It's really pathetic. And, um, you know, and this is all heightened because of maximum Twitter uh, character count. We have social media posts where it's just a minute of just talking points. And it's tough. It's really tough. But um, yeah, first step is being okay with complex ideas. And then the other thing is we need to absolutely maximize free speech. And that's just really a bottom line value that I think we should all have. Maximizing free speech is one of the most powerful tools for one, expressing nuance and two, changing people's minds if they're maybe misguided about a specific opinion or at least give them the availability to hear about a different opinion. I love listening to Joe Rogan, even though I probably disagree with him on virtually everything except like all the questioning he's been doing about COVID. I think he's a great voice. Um, I listen to, you know, then I'll listen to Ben Shapiro, who I probably agree with on a lot of things, even though he's probably more extreme to um, on, on, on different things than I am. So I just really want to encourage people to one, be OK with nuance and be OK with the possibility of nuance in ideas and to be OK with free speech. And that's why I think Elon, you know, purchasing Twitter for forty four billion dollars is actually kind of important because not only, you know, do I want my conservative friends and my account to actually be able to grow for the work that we're putting into it, but he's going to open source the algorithm, which is important because we're now going to be able to when he does that, see and read the algorithm like a book and understand how each piece of content is being promoted because the flow of information is going from you to the internet and 90% of our public discourse happens there. And that's why this big tech censorship issue is so important. And I'm always encouraging young people to go work in tech who are specifically conservative because I'm like, first of all, tech is really lucrative and you can become really rich. I've seen it happen a million times, but you can also hopefully, you know, defend good ideas and free speech online. So that's kind of the the broad answer, but free speech is definitely shocker <laughs> the answer. That, yeah, that's a problem. It's it's very hard to to question things nowadays. Like to ask for have a follow-up question and ask for some more details or go against the grain. I think I read an article about uh, I think you posted it as uh, an AI um, engineer got fired for yeah. uh, questioning the yeah. algorithm. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. And with all these movements, there's words you can't say. And then uh, it gets to the point where you can't say anything because it's going to be against something. Someone. Yeah. And if we start qualifying disagreements as dangerous, hate speech, threatening speech, harassment, all that, then 
what are you going to be able to say? I mean, the fact that on like Instagram, I can't say that women are women and men are men. That's a very dangerous place for society to be because I'm not going to morally agree with the prevailing narrative. But at the same time, we see in the LGBTQ um you know, movement, suicide rates are like 44% higher than they are with just regular people, right? Um, Self-harm, substance abuse, all of those stats are really heightened. Plus people are making decisions that will permanently affect their, either their fertility or their hormone makeup or legitimate like body parts that they have for, you know, the rest of their life. And they're giving up parts of themselves that are definitely that are, you know, made and ordained by God. Right. So we want to be able to have these conversations so people don't make decisions to get, you know, a transgender surgery. And then five years later, when they're like 21, they come to regret it and they're you know sterile for the rest of their life. That's what the conservative heart is. We don't want to go in and control your life. We don't want to go in and be like, er, you know, you have to do all of these things the right way. We're going to go in and say, he, Hey, here's what I'm doing. Here's what i believe here's a thousand years of political and cultural and religious tradition that is backing my position up. Here's how it'll lead to you being happier. You can make your own decision, but I also want to in love. And that's the important part in love that a lot of conservatives forget in love. I want to relay that to you and hopefully convince you um, of otherwise. As a hardcore conservative, I'm sure you've, you've gotten this, this question or just being out there in general. Uh, What's this? We got a little pop up. (laughs) <laughs> time just, left. How much time have we got? Yeah, it's about 10 minutes. But you can always restart the video thing. Okay. I don't know. This has never happened. Is that an upgrade? I don't know. Can you exit it? Yeah, we need to. So we're going to start it again? I don't know. This has never happened. Can you just hit the X? Okay. Sorry about that. You're good. Um, I kinda, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Oh. Okay, so throughout the pandemic, we were, you know, the vaccine mandates were were very obviously controversial, and conservatives were like, my body, it's my choice, my kind of thing, right? And then with the transgender talk, especially heating up in, in Texas, we're kind of, I feel like conservatives are kind of doing, they're, they're, they're kind of being hypocrites a little bit, saying, I'm, I'm not saying I'm for, like, you should go you know, butcher kids up or whatever at that young age. But right. If the parents and the kids are wanting to, shouldn't that same message apply to them? Even if it's, you know, pro choice, pro life, shouldn't that same my body, my choice, like, don't you can't force me to do something. Shouldn't that be applied to everything? Yeah. And that's a very common misconception because that's a very libertarian position. And as a conservative, I I also thought the argument of my body, my choice was a little bit silly um, for the mask mandates. My argument was I don't have or you don't have the right to make. Um, no, what was it? I don't have the right to not let you get sick. Um, if I'm not sick and you're you know, young and healthy, <laughs> then it's not my right to make sure that you don't get sick because that, that's kind of my argument for that. But as a conservative, I believe that there is a moral standard and there is moral tradition that is backing that up. And there is a specific role and purpose of government to protect the people from um, harm domestically foreign and actually to themselves. That's why we have laws against drugs. And that's why we have laws against what age of, you know, what is considered rape, what is considered set, uh, consent, things like that. And so as a conservative, my position is, yes, we should absolutely not let people hurt themselves. And it's actually really interesting in December 12th, 2020, the U N or UK, I don't remember, but they had a, a, their you know highest court re- put it in a decision that said we are not allowing um, people under the age of 16, 17 to use hormone blockers because there is not enough evidence that this benefits them long term. And so, you know, hopefully that kind of decision will come down to America and you, like you said, specifically Texas. And so I think the government has an absolute obligation to protect people from themselves. And in that way, government should be limited. Um, um, in, in its overreach, not too big, not too small, because I also want limited government. But when it comes to mutilating your own body, you know, you need to be able to. Yes. I mean, if you're older, you know, if you're like 25 and you're making that decision, then I think there's some grounds that you can say, hey, my body, my choice. But really, where the the conservatives gripe against it is we want to protect kids. And in the public school system, you're not allowed to prescribe a kid um 
Tylenol, but you're allowed to give them hormone blockers without telling their parents. And that's really where the issue that conservatives has kind of stems from. So we want to protect kids. And I think that the government has an obligation to protect people from themselves. Is that is that true? I didn't know that. So you don't you can't give a child Tylenol or aspirin, but you can give them hormone blockers. That's true. Not not in Texas, but okay. in some very blue states. Yeah, oh, um, okay. I can I can get sources on that if you would like. Jeez, I've never heard of that. Like giving know. hormone blockers out. Well, and they they qualify it under gender affirming care, mm. and so you know it it doesn't necessarily start with hormone blockers, but it starts with yeah. I think if you are a boy, you might actually be a girl, and then it starts with it's okay to feel safe. There's actually stories of teachers who will bring children into schools and provide those children with cross dress cross clothing to like cross dress while they're at school change them back into their real clothes and then send them home right and it's actively mm. confusing the child about their sex about their um gender expression and i think that's very evil because actively confusing a child and specifically you know when um teachers or um pediatricians take an oath to be you know in charge of these kids they say i will not harm actively harm and do harm to these these children and we're seeing kind of that folding in on itself as well so the argument is much less my body my choice um you know if your parents are still legally over you then they have say in that as well as they should uh, but the government again should protect people from themselves and bad decisions they make when they're not fully conscious of the long-term effects of the decisions they're making i would love to talk to a uh uh gender affirming doctor or you know the, the the ones that talk to the child about this stuff um I, i've tried to reach out to a couple of them here around locally and they don't want to come on but i want i like yeah. we want to understand what really goes into the process of meeting with these kids um that are confused or whatever right. um because john um john something let me let me pull that up. He okay. did a study talking about how nine from anywhere from 65 to 94, 96 percent of children actually grow out of their gender dysphoria by the time that they're right past puberty. And so that's why it's so dangerous to affirm a child's confusion when we know that they're probably just going to grow out of it um, in the future. Yeah. I mean, puberty is your red flag, right? right. I mean, that's when you know. I don't know the rates here in Texas, but have there been surgeries on on children here in texas i don't i mean i assume so because okay. we have the best medical centers in the world however i don't i don't track like the specific individuals in texas it was john brooks um and he did a study on kged.org okay john just brooks. to cite my look, sources if i can no yeah you. no definitely no i'll, I'll look into that because that's I'm I'm interested in like you said hearing both sides of the argument yeah. and like I said I that's something I would never want to do with my kids is take them into um, if they're confused or wanting to wear dresses or sometimes like sometimes my son will play with Barbie dolls and I never used to think about it before but now with all this shit going around I'm like okay like all right let them just hopefully give them the truck let them go play with the truck a little bit you know well that's the thing like i have two little brothers and if they played with barbie dolls the barbie dolls would be superheroes flying around you know destroying things there are you know natural behaviors that each child has but also it's funny because one contradiction that i see in the leftist argument is um they say that your gender is a spiritual thing. It's, you know, tied to your physical body. That's why we have to change your physical body. But then at the same time, we have the left saying, oh, but what you wear and what you do and what you engage in doesn't define your gender. It doesn't define your sex. But all of a sudden you have these parents saying, oh, you know, I put a green or a blue and a pink shirt in front of my son and he picks the pink shirt for school. He must be a woman. <laughs> and that's, you know, like that's first of all, not very reliable because choose to choose kids choose weird things all the time, which is totally fine. Um, but I would like them to choose. Is it the outward expression and behavior and actions that you engage in defining of your sex and gender? Or is it a spiritual biological thing that you need to change your biological makeup to be able to express, you know, what is what is a woman? What is femininity? What is a man? What is masculinity? And what do the natural expressions of each of those look like? And let's stick to that. Yeah. What do you think about the like the demasculinity of, of men today? Because that's very that's, that's that's something that's very pushed. And I don't know if it's true or not. Like, is it really happening? Are men becoming 
less manly today because of like the woke narrative or is it just a, a headline that you see on Fox News? Uh, I love that question. And yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you need to start with is like, just look around. Men are smaller, fatter, you know, less muscular. They're not motivated to work out. And I don't have a study here, but I know that in the past, you know, since World War II, testosterone has literally been kneecapped. So testosterone levels um, of Gen Z men are specifically the lowest that they've ever been. And um, you can see it by the product of what each sex, when they participate in society in a healthy way, what their fruits are, right? Men express themselves by way of career, building things, um, you know, building and being successful, protecting a family, how much they stand up for honor and they're attracted to things of that nature. Women express themselves more so, and I'm speaking in very general terms, in finding beauty in the world, inserting life into situations that there wasn't life before in curating and caring for a family, which is a great thing. Um, They can find that fulfillment in the workforce by bringing great camaraderie, things like that. And so we can just see that as the the sexes are getting more confused, um, men are getting less bold, less protective, and their testosterone literally is dropping. And so I think it's not, there also is an active attack on men. I mean, if you're manly, you're going to be called a toxic masculine type. Playing devil's advocate. Do you think it's because we're trying to, instead of men being, you know, so work focused and so, uh, goal oriented, do you think like it's, it's kind of a good thing to where we can kind of slow down now and kind of enjoy the beauty of life? Like, maybe experience like what is the meaning of life is the meaning of life for me to work hard and climb the a corporate ladder and make all the money or is it okay to just enjoy my family time and and, and be mm-hmm. with my wife be with my kids like is there yeah, a Yeah ba- and I think there? I think what's complicated about your question is we assume that relating to your family is an inherently feminine thing. Women get more fulfillment from that and we relate to it differently than men do. So I don't I wouldn't go so far to say that having time with your family makes you more feminine. I think that's totally wrong. Um, But there is a very masculine way to do things. For example, actually, my parents are a perfect example. I was reading by the pool one day and I was thinking about like, what does femininity mean? What does masculinity mean? And I was, it was my first time thinking about it. And I was like, well, I guess femininity could mean um, cooking, cleaning, you know, my very just initial thoughts was like, what are feminine things? And I looked up and, or, and then I was like, okay, masculinity would be like around the house, would be like doing yard work, lifting furniture, doing a job, <laughs> things like that. And I was like, I guess those could kind of work. And I literally looked up. My dad was in the outdoor kitchen cooking a meal for the family. My mom was raking leaves and burning wood in a <laughs> pile. So I was like, I was like, wait, that can't work. That can't be right. So what I've come to after a year of studying is femininity is the expression of love, love, dignity, um, selflessness, and um, just nature of a woman. And masculinity would be the expression of courage, boldness, and, um, you know, the manly expression, I guess, if you will, um, that comes from a man. So the idea that there are things that type people into it's kind of like you know if my son's playing with a barbie doll he must be a woman that's that's false either way around that's false if it's a liberal trying to say my son is a a woman or if a conservative is trying to say oh well that man is masculine there is a masculine way to relate to things that we do so as i said relating to a family doesn't make you more feminine necessarily i hope that answers your question no it does um i i think a, a man too like we have this idea of a man from a hundred years ago or whatever, where the man, ha- we, we were building things, chopping down, tr- like the industrial revolution. That's what a, ma- a man in our eyes is. But we get to this point where we have r- robots basically wiping our ass. <laughs> we're not doing anything anymore. And we evolve into a different type of man. And I wonder if, I don't know if that man is going to exist anymore when we have nothing to do besides like well, a gym rat person. That's that- actually a really good point. And I was uh, my second point about what you said, um, Jonathan, it was, I, I wanted to say like, you're like, Hey, we can slow down, enjoy, enjoy life now, not climb the corporate ladder. But like, we're not doing that. 
is Gen Z or millennials, are they happy? Are they fulfilled? Are they focusing on the good things in life? Or are we focused on political outrage, focused on smashing the gender norms? Are we focused on the good things in life? Um, And I would say we're not. And so that leads a conservative like myself to think, well, because there is such rebellion against traditional and rigid gender roles in society and different expectations, not worth expectations and responsibilities for the sexes, And there is a rebellion against traditional religion. And there's this emphasis of radical feminism, full liberation, abortion on demand. And as a product, suicide rates have gone up. Confusion about sexual expression is, I mean, skyrocketing. Almost 20 percent of Gen Z identifies LGBTQ now Hmm. in with like the greatest generation right after the war. 1% 1% did. So you you have to think like, oh, there must be some societal pushing going on to make Gen Z think that we are lazier. We are fatter. We are more sedated. We are more fearful than ever. And so that leads me to think since there's an assault on such a so many traditional things, maybe we should go back to tradition. Maybe we should go back to expecting things from men and expecting things from women that we know based off of, you know, thousands of years of Western civilization brings fulfillment, builds amazing societies, thinks critically, um, provides for their families, their countries and their nations. Right. Should we not go back to those things? Because right now, with all this new progression, liberation, we are a total train wreck. We are a mess. No, I agree. Where can you uh, meet in the middle with uh, the left, I want to know like some of the ideas that you can see the left's point of view. Oh my gosh, environment! I'm not I'm not a green energy person, but conservatives, we we care about the environment so deeply. If you don't like, most conservatives will probably mow their own grass and do their own gardening. Most conservatives, you know, don't mess with Texas, right? What does that mean? It means don't litter. Conservatives, we want to conserve things. And so why is the environment not within that? Now, I'm not going to go so far and say, okay, well, I want to drink out of a friggin' paper straw because they literally make everything taste gross and they disintegrate (laughs) in your mouth and they're the worst. But I think like, you know, if you have a mask on, freaking throw your mask away in the trash can. If you can, um, you know, try and not litter everywhere. Do good by your environment. Protect the soil. That's an important thing. Protect the oceans. I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, 90 percent of our coral reefs have been totally destroyed. And I think that's something that we need to um, bond over because the environment is so important. It's the source of our food. And now I'm not going to go and say, you know, don't eat meat, eat soy products because soy literally lowers the testosterone in men and raises the estrogen in women. And we don't need any more estrogen as women, <laughs> let me tell you. But I think there are ways that we can, you know, I think Tesla's a great company. I think if you don't want to, if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, you shouldn't be forced to do so. You should be able to make that decision. Another thing is, and I have not heard anyone argue against this ever, but the one issue that everyone needs to and can unite over is human trafficking. I mean, come on, we live in Houston, that we are the human trafficking capital of Texas because we're so close to the border. We are the first stop aside from Corpus Christi that traffickers stop to you know, disperse their uh, services, if you will, across the United States. It is, I mean, fighting against human trafficking is pro-justice, it's pro-law and order, it's pro-woman, it's pro-life, it's... Um, It's just pro everything good and anti everything bad. So I think that if we really want to start making inroads, we need to find ways that we can agree on um, the environment, one and two, um, human trafficking, because those are two issues that universally affect all of us. And we can all I hope we can all agree on, um, except for the top people who are engaging in the human trafficking. But uh, that's a different story. (laughs) So you, yeah, definitely the environment uh, for me as well. Right, but do you believe in climate change? <laughs> I don't know as much about <laughs> it as I should. But my question is, when is the climate not changing? Although one thing I do want to bring up, and I think you might find this interesting, is I my my family does a lot of crypto, big crypto family, and we talk about like using. I don't remember what it's specifically called, but basically the gas emissions that come from actually fracking oil to run the mining machines to actually mine the Bitcoin or in the whatever 
uh, blockchain you're using, right? You use that gas to mine. And it's funny because right now when, when the oil like spits up from the ground and the gas comes off of it while we're using the oil, the gas just gets burned and goes into the air. And, you know, the environmentalists are typically like really angry about that. And they're like, oh, well, you know, the main reason is there's not going to be enough oil, um, which I don't know all the details. I've heard that there is enough oil. So I'll just stick with that. <laughs> but, um, and they're like, oh, well, this gas is going into the air. And I'm like, okay, so why don't we use that to start mining cryptocurrency and making people rich as they go along? Because we've seen that up to 99 and most of the times 100% of that gas that goes up can be funneled and used into mining. So in, in, a, in a way, you know, cryptocurrency and using your computers to mine on a blockchain can be the can be helpful in curing um, any gas emissions that are coming up from oil fracking. And of course, I probably butchered all of that, but I, um, I've crypto people are really excited about it. But all of a sudden, the left hears that, oh, you're using energy and they're immediately against it. And so I would really like to make inroads on that to say, hey, you can make money while also cleaning up the environment um, and using your computer and giving people access to you know, gas and um, electricity. So sorry, that was totally a tangent. Um, but I think it's a really interesting development specifically with the blockchain. No, oh, that's, that's great. And I love your, your responses too, because uh, folks that may see little snippets of you from here and there, they might like, oh, she's just a radical right person, just a Trumper, no one she's, but you obviously, you know, you could see both sides of the issue and that's, that's really good and humbling to hear. So. That'd be a good show to have like, to where you have to, to where the, a left person talks about where they agree on the right and, and vice versa. And there's a, that's a, why I love the show middle ground um, produced by Jubilee. Have you I, heard of that I show? I haven't heard of that. You one. should definitely look it up. It's middle ground. They basically have groups of people on different sides of the aisle come together and literally just have an open discussion. They actually asked me to be on an episode, but I was too old, um, <laughs> <laughs> too old, but yeah, middle ground by Jubilee. It's, I mean, the discussions are civil, really high production value and um, really, really insightful. So that's cool. good. I'll check it out. It's a, it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or what? YouTube, YouTube channel, YouTube show, I think. Yeah. Okay. I, I like um, Joe Rogan always mentions the, the, what is it? Crystal and Sager. Because Sagar is kind of like a, a right wing guy, and Crystal's pretty left wing, so that's mm -hmm. pretty good. Like they give their spin on the news and stuff like that. So yeah, that's good. Well, and that kind of goes back to our talk about maximum free speech. I mean, we need maximum ideas to be out in the world so that people can gravitate toward ideas that are good. However, that doesn't mean that a four year old needs to be learning about gender queer expression, right? You need to there's this common mantra in conservative politics is you don't need to teach a, or you need to don't people teach people what to think, teach them how to think. And I'm like, well, you can't teach them how to think unless you teach them what to think first. Right. You can't teach a kid that two plus two equals four, but also it could equal five if you wanted it to. You need to teach a young child that two plus two equals four so that they have a framework of basic mathematics to build, you know, more advanced mathematics off of. I think we'd all agree with that. Um, and so our education system needs to, and I hate this word, but be reformed in a way where, like Ron DeSantis is doing, not allowing teachers to teach gender expression, Marxist cultural ideas to children from pre-K to third grade. You know, they're not allowed to teach gender ideology to these children because they're young and they don't have the faculties of reason until they get to maybe late high school and college to be able to discern um what is true about the world. Um, anyway, that's, a, I keep going on these tangents because you're bringing up so many important ideas, but we need to be able to teach people the truth of the parameters and then they can think of all the other ideas when it's appropriate for them to hear those ideas, I guess. Yeah, it's tough because it's important. Like you want, like I want my kids to experience stuff from other people too. Um, right. You know, not just hear my beliefs and my way of thinking or my wife's way of thinking, but like it's, there's the, there's a fine gray line, right? Like what is too much sometimes? Like I agree, mm -hmm. like we don't want them to be indoctrinated, but not every teacher is indoctrinated them, you know, not every teacher, Definitely. Is a, a, not every teacher is a bad thing. So it's, I agree. No, we, many teachers are phenomenal, fantastic and stick to their curriculum and stick to enriching a child's mind or, you know, a teenager's mind instead of trying to pervert them. Yeah. What do you, the, I, I think you're going to like this one. It's kind of a controversial thing, but, um, and I've kind of seen your views on it. Um, what do you think about 
the Christian community being more accepting of uh, of gay people. Oh my gosh! I for some reason I just like knew you were gonna go there. <laughs> that's so funny. I mean, but it is ha- it's happening, and that's like one of y'all's one of Christians' core values. Right. No, um, and that's a great question. So it's a complex issue. Yes, my theological response is: if we believe that every sin is equal, you know, because every sin is equal in God's eyes, and you could be forgiven for all of them except blasphemy. That's one exception. Uh, If you can be forgiven for pretty much all the sins, then what makes me more deserving of being able to go to church and listen to the gospel and take the services of the church than a gay person? I suffer, uh, let's say, with impatience really badly. What makes that different than someone who is a homosexual? The difference is I don't believe that we should support that. As a very traditional Reformed Baptist Christian, The Bible explicitly says that there is an order and there are only there are three institutions that God ordained the church, the government. And he lays out government a lot in the new in the Old Testament and then a family and the family is made up of the fundamental roles, which is men, man and woman and then a child. So man and woman are equal and then a child is underneath them. And that, you know, that's explained in Ephesians chapter six, first Peter two, a lot of different places. And so I think that as a traditional Christian, we absolutely need to stick to the way that God ordained the family, the institution of a family and maintain that integrity. So when it comes to someone, you know, there's a difference between someone having homosexual thoughts and tendencies and wanting to not act on them and change. Right. And someone who's actively engaging in that and trying to use Christianity, love is love to justify it. Um, I'm morally against the second option. I'm not morally against the first option because everyone suffers in their own unique ways. And that's what the community of their church should be better at. I have plenty of critiques about the church, as many other people do as well. But we need to be doing better at helping people um, get over the things that they suffer from if they've gone to a place where they repent and they want to change. Do you have any friends that are are Christian that are gay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just asking because I didn't I didn't know if you if you did and if you agreed with them and you know like how you, how you got along and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have like close friends who would identify as that, but I definitely like I've been you know as I said like I did a lot of stuff in L.A. and there were lots of people. Oh, I'm a Christian and I'm also gay, you know. And you have to love on them. I mean, seriously, because this is the most this is the hardest topic, right? Because if you disagree with someone, how can you love on them? But you know, the Bible says love and pray for your enemies and not saying that you need to make an enemy of everyone just so you can pray for them, (laughs) but (laughs) you need to be able to engage with someone. I think that Gen Z is really bad at splitting up professional from personal. And what I mean by that is I, we probably disagree on a ton, but professionally, of course, I'm going to shout out this podcast. I'm going to get along. Like, I'm not going to like sue you guys or anything like ridiculous like that. Personally, we may not agree on a lot of things, but I'm not going to let that affect my professional conversations when it comes to our brains coming together and arguing and battling about ideas. That's not what we should um, be aiming for. Gen Z confuses professional and personal all day long. We assume that if you disagree you are devaluing me as a human being. And so that's where we get this really sensitive eggshell topic of, oh, I'm gay. You must want me to die and be decapitated. It's like, no, 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 (laughs) no. I love you and I value you as a human being. I'm allowed and have full liberty to disagree with everything you're doing. And I can also easily express um, why I disagree with it. Here are all the Bible verses. This is the proper order that I believe that the Lord has set the world up in. Now you tell me why you disagree. So I don't know. I think, yeah, we need to get better at professionally, quote unquote, disagreeing and personally disagreeing without getting emotional and offended. But also the church needs to be better at accepting people who suffer from conditions and express that they want to change those behaviors. Yeah. I love what you said um, about disagreeing and still being civil because and it, that kind of relates to being able to talk about a situation. Um, uh, now you almost can't even talk about something if you're not that subject. If you don't identify as that subject, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, well, like, like woman's abortion. You, I, 
men aren't even like we're told to just shut the hell up you can't even like have an opinion about it or i know racism if you're white you you don't know anything about it so you can't even just you you, you don't have any justification to talk about it um, i get comments on some of my videos that deal with race saying bro you can't be racist to white people and i'm like hello what now <laughs> <laughs> So that's my face. But yeah, I mean, that's the same thing, actually, with sexism. I've recently been exploring the idea of the progression of the word sexism. And I believe that it's gone through five stages since probably about the 1960s. And so in short, those five stages are first stage is the definition of sexism, discrimination legally based off of someone's sex. Then sexism kind of turned into this idea of um you are not allowed to factor a person's sex into your decision. Say a project doesn't get done. You are not allowed to say, oh, it's because she's a woman. She didn't get it done. Right. That kind of thing. Then sexism started to become. Um, I did this all last week. <laughs> sexism started to become the idea of traditionalism is inherently sexist. So wanting someone to have their own um gender expression roles that we think society should uphold not force but uphold is now sexist and then it became if we are not actively trying to abolish those um, traditional roles in any semblance of religious or cultural tradition then we are actively being a sexist society after that it became um men and women you are sexist if you point out that men and women are different and so now you have this whole wide range of what the word sexism even means. And that's a really big problem I have with the left. So I always ask them, I'm like, what do you define sexism as? Let's agree on the first definition, discrimination based off of sex. Um, and then we'll have a conversation because me just pointing out that there's a biological difference between men and women is not sexist and it should never be sexist. I mean, hey, I'm not a biologist, but I do know that there are differences between men and women. So I think we need to Again, coming back to fundamental truths, we need to agree on ideas of definitions too. That's obviously the first place to start. Oh, that's great. Well, I wish I knew what you know at 20. I know, right? No, it's impressive. Oh. It's because you're homeschooled. Homeschooled kids oh, are, yeah. are freaking smart. Oh, yeah, they actually learn smart. shit. Yeah. They actually learn shit at home. We've, uh, we try, we try. Well, the thing is, I didn't learn math very well. Like, I literally self-taught myself algebra, geometry, algebra two, like all of it. I didn't do that well. But what I did learn is how to argue, how to defend my ideas, how to research. And so, you know, it just depends on the homeschool education you receive, because I received a classical education, which I'm very thankful for. Um, which emphasized humanities, Bible, culturative history, English, public speaking, things like that, um, instead of STEM. So if you ask right. me to do a complex math problem, <laughs> well, I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> you, could, uh, you could Google it. Um, yeah, right. Just use my calculator. <laughs> I'm sure your uh, your parents are pretty pretty smart too. Uh, yes. A lot of influence yeah. from your family. I mean, do y'all see eye to eye? You and your family? Oh, totally. My dad has, okay. has a seven degrees and my mom has two. Yeah. And then my brother, my brother went to Baylor when he was 16, actually. So he's, he's the one older than me. And then I have four siblings younger than me. So there's six kids. Um, I decided to not go to college, um, but we all, you know, did speech and debate. And my dad's a lifelong, like I, I always joke about the foundation of our house is literally made of books. Like we have books everywhere. We have books in boxes that we can't even put on a shelf because we don't have enough shelves for them. Um, and so it's just been a cool environment growing up in where my parents are both lifelong learners as well. So that really set a really good example for me to search for ideas and always have interesting conversations with them that I can hopefully take to a stage and inspire people to fight for something bigger than themselves. No, that's great. Well, Lily, uh, we know you got to go. Uh, we appreciate your time. What are the uh, your next big speaking engagements and where can people follow you and, and connect? Well, you can follow me on Instagram at it's Lily Kate. You can follow my Sanity Check show, which is a fun show at Sanity Check USA on TikTok and Instagram. Um, let me think. What am I doing next? Shoot. I don't actually know because I'm in the middle of season one with Sanity Check now. So I'll hopefully be getting a show with a bigger organization soon. So that'll kind of be the next step. Um, like but y'all, thanks for having me on. This was fun. And I would love to come back and 
you know, bring more research and more get more topical with you guys. That'd be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll invite you back maybe before you get too big and get on the blaze and go to Fox uh-huh. News or something. <laughs> we'll invite you back. It, I feel like in-person conversations always flow a little bit better. The virtual ones are great, but it's like you can't read body language and stuff like that. So a little different. Yeah, a little different. I will calculate my time a little bit better next no, time. No, it's not your fault. That's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs>